one's going to pay attention to anything for more than five minutes. <laughs> and if you can't do it, none of your kids can do it. So if you have any activity that goes for more than five minutes, and the very first explanation I have of this is in a book from 1832 by a guy named William Alcott, who wrote Schoolmaster. Five minutes is the attention limit of most humans. Unless something else happens to, to alter what's going on. The second thing is, there has to be this level of instructional tolerance. I didn't yell at any of you for talking to people in the corner and not doing what I asked. Because it really doesn't matter. If I tell you to do something, you're not going to pay any attention. You either win people's attention or you don't win people's attention. And people get out of things all, all sorts of ways. So the conversation in the corner may be far more important than anything I have on the screen. A lot of you determine that. How many of you think that's perfectly okay for your students to determine that? How come? Why are you different than they are? You're the mature ones. It should be easy for you, right? <laughs> so one of the, the first thing that I always talk about, and my role, and I always say this is nice work if you can get it, and I'm not entirely sure that I have it at work yet, but my role is as a provocateur. My idea is to ask the questions that people don't tend to ask about schools. To say to people, why do we do what we do, and is there any purpose to and as Carl said, I know a whole lot. My dissertation is about the history of American education, which is something that was very carefully designed. There's nothing natural in this building, in your school. None of it grew on trees. It's very carefully designed by people, and I can take you through every design step to do very specific things. The first thing our education system was designed to do was to fail 80% of students. That's the goal. That's why we do everything that we do in school. It's why we have grades one through eight. The idea was to get rid of 10% of kids a year, and 20% of kids would go to high school. That's why we have grade level expectations and age appropriate stuff, because if people don't match those appropriate things, the goal was to toss them out. As Woodrow Wilson famously said to the University of Virginia, we need a whole lot more miners and factory workers than we need clerks. And our goal is to get kids out of school before they're 12. Everything we do is designed around that basis. Every test we give, every curriculum we format where we say you're this age, so this is what you're supposed to do, is designed to fail students. We have behavioral standards to do the same thing. We copied our system of education after something called the Prussian model, which was designed by the Prussian government, it was now Germany, at the beginning of the 19th century because they thought they had lost to Napoleon because Prussian soldiers made their own decisions. And they were going to be damn sure that never happened again. So they decided the education system around compliance students would learn to do what we told them to do. We imported that whole pod into this country <laughs> to do the same thing. Make sure students learn to do what we told them to do. And school is, I have a professor in Michigan State who always says, the hidden <coughs> curriculum is not hidden at all. It is the curriculum. Sit in your chair, shut up, do what you're told. First thing Barack Obama said in his first speech welcoming students to school his first year in office was, sit down and be quiet. <laughs> Very first thing. That's, that's where school begins for students, and there's a purpose for that, to train compliance. If we don't want compliance, we have to think of different things that, that we do all day. So just a couple of things in terms of sort of housekeeping. We have this today's meet feed going. You can put questions in here if you want. Today's meet is a very simple, it's just the link is todaysmeet.com, all one word, todaysmeet.com, at Camp MN. 
Today's meet is an internal Twitter. A lot of teachers use for their classes. This is really hot in elementary and middle schools for students discussing things when videos are on, stuff like that, because it allows you to have an internal social network feed going on. Um, it was actually developed by my son when I was first asked to teach a class with 80 students at Michigan State, and I said I have no idea how to listen to them. So we did this, and I could see what people were asking. You also get much richer conversations because kids who won't talk will type. Kids who have language problems and thus don't like the way they sound will type. It's in a Twitter form, or a text form, so spelling and grammar don't matter to people and, and it's, it's tolerable. Um, but we can also go to the Twitter feed using the hashtag. We'll talk about a couple of reasons why we to go through this stuff and the advantage of being out there with people. So I called this, for lack of a better thing, imagining the tools of the global classroom. One of the things that's really kind of funny, I find, is this argument over 21st century learning skills. And I say that's a term I really refuse to use because we're in the 13th year of the 21st century. Our students will live their lives in the mid-21st century. <laughs> they don't know any other century, nor, I mean, they should know other centuries historically, but they have no reason to use 19th century tools. We do not teach kids how to make papyrus anymore. Uh, we don't teach them how to chase the duck and pluck the feather and cut the quill. We don't teach them how to carve into stone tablets. There's a reason for this. Every time information and communication technology changes, there's this massive resistance on the part of people in power, people who are empowered by the fact that they are masters of the old system. So, Socrates was viciously opposed to literacy. He said literacy would destroy your ability to trust knowledge because you didn't have the speaker in front of you, you didn't know who they were, you couldn't question them. The priest scribes of the 15th century were heavily opposed to the printing press. According to them, it took away your ability to have all the illustration and stuff that was basically part of, of reading and writing back then. Plus, books were no longer interpreted each time they were reproduced as they had been before. In the 1960s, Catholic schools used to require kids to write with fountain pens because ball points were too easy. You could hold the pen wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter. People, people who are good at whatever they're good at like to protect that system. Um, and, but that's not the way the world works these days. Your students <coughs> will spend a thousand times more hours a year in their future, whatever their job is, Skyping with people in other countries than they will writing essays. That's just the facts of what the world is like right now. And it depends whether you're equipping students for your life or their life. And, and this is something that we get into all the time. And there's a reason that I bring this up. I start with the word doubt, because I say doubt everything we hear all the time. This is a real interesting chart. The red is how people do on that how countries do on that international, you know, series of <coughs> math tests or PISA tests. Okay, we're real worried about that. This is why we want to copy China and Singapore. Because Singapore is here. So that's the red. The blue is an interesting thing. The blue is the entrepreneurial index for the country. How many patents are created? How many <coughs> products come to market? Hmm. Kind of crosses. I mean, I will give Slovenia really high points for doing both pretty well, and, and Australia does both pretty well. But I was just in Ireland doing stuff. Here's the United States, here's Ireland. We're both real worried about our scores. Ireland, which is a country with under 4 million people, is the world's number one exporter of software. This is not their problem. Math scores are not their problem. <laughs> what we see is that the more you devote to those, the ability of your students to take the test, 
basically the worse your economy will do, which is one of those great, I, I can't get Arty Duncan to respond to this graph. Because, <laughs> um, you know, they don't, they don't want to look at it that way. They're, they have a different agenda in mind. And so, like I said, we have to ask why school was created this way and why we tweak the system that was designed to do things we don't want it to do anyway. It's real interesting. I have, digitally, a letter sent from the head of the cult uh, revolver works to the head of education in Connecticut, explaining that they want to start, this is 1843, they want to run two shifts a day. And their workers don't understand the idea of showing up for work on time. Of course they didn't. At that time, there was no such thing as time for work or school. You got up in the morning, you did whatever you had to do, and then you went to work or school. When you were done there, you left and you went home. But they want to run two shifts a day. They need an industrial shift. So he says, your schools have to have a start time. That's why we have a start time for school. It has nothing to do with education. That's what nothing simply training people to go to work in factories that don't exist anymore. <laughs> right now in America, right now, 40% of white collar workers do not have an office. Do not have a place they call work that they go to. That's right now. That whole idea of the work day, getting to the workplace on time, doing those things is gone. The big question is, can your student get done what they have to do sitting on the floor in the corner of the airport where the outlet is? <laughs> can they talk to someone who speaks a different language effectively on the fly? They have the tools at their hands to do that. Okay? Without time to prep, <laughs> without time to take the language class, can they do that when they have to? These are the kinds of things that matter. Not can you sit in a room with a whole bunch of people doing the same thing, because that doesn't happen anymore. So with a bunch of other <coughs> educators, we've developed this idea that I'll talk about a little bit called the iridescent classroom. And I say, I didn't come up with that word because I can't even spell it. <laughs> this is not my thing. But we talk about key things that, that learning is visible. We're tired of students hiding their papers and doing things by themselves, because the world doesn't work that way. That has no value. Learning is valuable when it is shared, and when it is part of things. But learning is actively shared. People see what's going on. We, we, you know, we aggressively, if you watch this stream or that stream, you saw a lot of people writing on floors, writing on windows, writing on walls. Um, the idea is graffiti, in our way, and it's erasable graffiti, but it's graffiti, is really valuable because this is how we share stuff. Right from the first cave painting, this is the most essential human thing. We, we share things. And learning is choice driven. Students do not learn to make choices unless they make actual choices all the time. So, choice has to be a real constant. Uh, part of everything. And then learning is connected. It's not constricted by walls, whether they're real or virtual or imagined. Um, if you need to know, I mean, I have a third grade class that wanted to know about Egypt, so they Skype with a class in Egypt and ask them about it. Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> if you're not doing that, what are you not giving your kids? What are they not accessing? Um, and it's adaptive. And spaces, and when I mean spaces, I mean physical spaces and virtual spaces. Spaces adapt to students. Students don't adapt to spaces. I walk into classroom after classroom, and I say to teachers, any of you have furniture like this at home? <laughs> Um, you know, while on the other hand, I walk into Ford's rebuilt assembly plant where they do focuses and stuff now in, in Michigan, and it's carpeted, there are TVs all over the place, there are couches, 
teams of people decide when they're taking time off and when they're not. The teams rotate through tasks, and actually every team spends one week a year doing a final inspection, so they understand what that's about. That's an assembly plan. I went with a young man, because I worked with a lot of students with disabilities from the Pope Rehab Agency in Michigan. I went for a job interview, entry-level job, driving a high-low at a furniture factory. I live in the furniture, office furniture center of the university. Entry-level job, $11 an hour, driving a high-low. His interview was nobody from HR, five people that he'd be working with on his team in the room, two people from Europe on Skype, one person from Tokyo on Skype. That's the interview to get an entry-level factory job. Okay. What skills are we graduating students with to do that? have that kind of conversation. So he has to know when the guy from Tokyo calls and says, I need to switch what's on this truck. He knows how to do it and how to work with that information. So what I want to do, and, and you know, from here on, we're mostly dealing in images, but it is take you through the thing, the concept of, of why we change, how we change, <coughs> and what we're looking for producing. And I always say, I'd like to start by imagining, what if we didn't know what school looked like? What would school look like now? This is part of the new library at Virginia Commonwealth University, one of their study spaces. This was a great thing in Times Square last summer. These are reading bowls, <laughs> as you recall. Um, you know, phenomenal things. We're trying to build one of those at the school in Michigan. Um, this is a classroom in San Diego. Um, lots of workplaces and things because a couple of things that we have to teach our students to do is to create their own learning and work environments. Um, so, how do you, in a totally chaotic environment, create the space you need to work? I don't care if you're in an airport or in an office. I was at Quicken Loans in Detroit. This is a mortgage company, right? This is hardly cutting edge, <laughs> you know, thing. But Quicken Loans is old beanbag chairs and, you know, coffee bars and a basketball court in the middle of the floor. And no one has desks. People have laptops <laughs> that they walk around with. I mean, it's sort of a 24-7 job, if not one I want, but the workplace is pretty comfortable. But it's also very chaotic. How do you work there? How do you create the environment you need to get your work done in that environment? My son works for Mozilla. When, I, when he worked out in California, and like many people in his age group in the 20s who are doing well now, he just said, I don't like California. I'm going to work from home, and home is going to be in New York. So he moved across the country and worked from home. But when he was out there, I visited him, and I walk up, and there are a couple of four people playing pool, drinking beer. It's 11 o'clock in the morning, but the bar is open all day. It's free there. And, but the conversation is not what I expect. The conversation is about coding <coughs> errors. Okay? So how do you combine those things comfortably? What are you doing in school to help kids get to that kind of environment where they can work there? If you go to coffee shops and watch all the people who are working, You'll see that when people want privacy these days, when they want to be alone, they put their earbuds in. The sig universal signal of this century that says, I'm working on something, leave me alone. Whether they have anything playing through that or not doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's entirely up to that. What's wonderful about that as someone who grew up as a non-reader and is sort of severe dyslexic is, if what I'm doing is listening to text instead of reading it, nobody has to know that. That's all up to me. So it's a universal design thing for all special needs students as well. I sort of love these pictures. This was a school I talked to one day, and the next day they sent me these pictures of the kids using those tiles on the wall as graph paper, <laughs> which I really love. And of course, when kids are writing on the desks, if they want to preserve it, they just take pictures of it, and it's, it's safe. But when the kids are writing on the desks, on the floor, on the windows, a couple of things are happening. They're using large muscles, which is really, really important. 
and they are, it is not a permanent thing. So 1841, same guy, William Alcott, who talked about the five minutes, said we needed, he pushed for the first one-to-one -one initiative in American schools, that we'd give every kid a slate to write on. He said, because kids were, would write more because they could erase more easily. Of course, back then, people say in response to him, you can't give these kids these expensive things. They will break. <laughs> Although in today's Pioneer Press, we're looking, briefly looking at it in the hotel, it's an amazing column from some columnist whose reason why we shouldn't have technology in school is that he never saw the former superintendent of St. Paul at the gas station. I thought, well, that's unique. <laughs> um, but we talk about choice and all sorts of things. This is an art room in Virginia where the teacher simply cut the legs down on the tables <laughs> to different heights to give kids the choice of how they want to work. This is a new tech school in Grand Rapids. One of their student workspaces where the idea is how do you want to sit, how do you want to share with people? You know, <coughs> the other big push among this is transparent. You'll notice the walls in the back, they don't have any walls of their classrooms that aren't sliding glass doors. And we have another school in Grand Rapids, a sixth grade school that's entirely glass. All the classroom walls are glass, all the exterior walls are glass, and it is the best working, most functional sixth grade I've ever seen in my life. You know why? They don't have to stay in the classroom. They can go wherever they need to be in the building because someone can see them all the time. And it takes all the pressure off the room if kids don't have to stay. And sixth graders don't want to stay. These are classrooms in Ireland. Well, this is a classroom. These kids are doing videos. Uh, this is a coder dojo, which is a voluntary after school uh, computer coding thing for basically ages <laughs> 6 through 18, where kids come and learn to program. And, but they learn to program by teaching each other. Uh, which is really the form of education that works best. And I was there on a Thursday afternoon on a beautiful spring day. There were 75 kids from this little town who had all poured in to do this. Um, we talked about kids getting comfortable, and that comfort is really essential. If you think about Maslow's Pyramid of Needs, if your student is uncomfortable, because the tag in the back of their shirt is bothering them, because your chairs suck, because they're hungry or thirsty, they're not thinking on a high cognitive level. It's not possible for them to be. You cannot learn at an advanced cognitive level if you're uncomfortable. Your brain simply won't allow it. It's gonna focus on the much more primal needs that, that dominate things. And kids need play. This was a school in Ireland where Every hour, they go out and they play curling, which is a wild sport. All grades, pre-K through six, go out to this mass curling game <laughs> and play <coughs> once an hour so the kids get to run. Um, again, just sort of a flexibility of classroom concept and, and age groups. But I always say you don't have to spend a great deal of money, although you can. This is a school in Copenhagen, this is a high school. It has these pods where kids get to lie around and that's their primary study area. On the other hand, in this library in Virginia, we just ripped out where the encyclopedias used to be, the big shelves, we put up little tack lights above them and had the Girl Scouts make pillows and made reading nooks. It cost a dollar. <laughs> So I want to show this quickly. This is sort of the end result if we're successful. This is a third grade class. They wanted to do something sort of mechanical making thing. So this was their end of the year project in science. This bizarre thing to open a door. This is a teacher who basically threw out all his classroom furniture. This is 
say the kid didn't want to sit in it anyway. Um, let the kids make all the decisions. When they start a project, everybody know what a wall wisher is? Like digital post-it notes you put up. The kids post things that say, I'm going to study this and I'm going to use these tools. So they're learning conscious choice of tool devices and stuff. Um, third graders, they write their own textbooks using LiveBinder. <laughs> um, third grade, they do everything. They Skype around the world, totally <coughs> inclusive class. And we have some kids who are troubled by some of the chaos. He has a number of Asperger's and Spectrum kids, and what he says to them is if you need your own space, go find a table and write your name on part of it and claim that space is your own each day. And they do that, and then that's theirs. <laughs> and the other students respect that. So you're teaching them how to solve their own problems. So one of the things I want you to think about as we, we get into this is, what are the technologies you have in your learning space? And I, I want you to think really broadly about this as an idea. Because technology is everything that we have chosen to put into the room. <coughs> to the chairs you're sitting in. This is a library where we cut down the, uh, the shelving to make window seats. Um, to the lighting. Everybody knows that if you have one level of lighting in a room, it's really bad for attention and really bad for people's eyes. But this was an idea of German industrialists in about 1910, and we stick with it in schools. If you look at libraries from the time, you'll always see that they have pools of light. It's really essential to eyesight that you move between different levels of brightness in order for your eyes to exercise themselves and relax. And if you don't provide dim, right, um, you have problems. These are true libraries. This is one in Mali. This is one in Germany. They both depend entirely on the outside. The only thing that's inside is where the books are stored. It's real interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you don't have to build the whole building. <coughs> one of the things I like about this picture is this kid here who's kneeling on the table. And the teacher says, all the other teachers would say, well, if he kneels on the table, every other kid will want to kneel on the table. He says, but that's not true. <laughs> Nobody else wanted to kneel on the table. They weren't, that wasn't their comfort level, that was his. This is, uh, just to show you, this was a, a lesson in teaching fourth graders in one of the most impoverished schools in terms of population I've ever been in. Um, you know these kind of schools. Teachers pack dinner into everybody's backpack every day to send home, pack the weekend's worth of meals on Friday into their backpacks, um, and panic at Christmas and summer because the kids won't eat when they're not in school. But we're teaching these kids how to multitask. Because this is a basic skill. Teacher's reading a story, and the kid's assignment is the kid's assignment is to look up anything they don't understand. Which is what we have to do when we listen to the world these days, right? <laughs> we have to get good at that. Um, and so they're continuing to pay attention to the best we can while trying to figure out. This was a story about the Titanic. It starts in Belfast in Northern Ireland, which is a long, long way for kids who've never been to Charlottesville, which is their county <coughs> seat. Uh, they live in a little hollow, but they were brilliant at that. They tracked everything. They knew what was going on. It was interesting. When this librarian sent it to the librarian of the school with a very privileged population, those kids couldn't do it. They were waiting for the librarian to <coughs> explain what the question was. And I thought, well, there's an interesting break about who's got the real privilege and who doesn't. 
But lots of people would say that's a bad thing to teach kids to do, to sort of not pay attention, to multitask, do all that. But we have to do it. I assume many of you are doing it right now and doing the right thing. Is this, is this important for me to know? What do I need to know about it um, to make it work? So we think about technology in its broadest possible sense of what, of what it can be and what it means to people. Um, where do they sit? Where do they go? How do they work? These students are sixth grade students taking a standardized test. Sit wherever you want. Test was on the computer, so take the computer wherever you want. We had kids curled up in the corner, jammed between uh, file cabinets and things, kids lying on their backs, holding the computer up in the air, lots of kids scrolling in their stomach, these ones sitting there. High stakes test, go where you want. Kids did much better on it, not surprisingly, than they had being forced to sit in things. This is in England, this is a playground for high school kids. Or a playground for high school kids. One of the big issues that kids always ask me is, middle school kids especially, is where's our playground? <laughs> Where do we get to go and climb and play and use that kind of stuff? Um, that's, this is a school in Sweden. Um, that's, you know, primary school through grade six. This is a, adapting a school in Virginia so the kids can gather at places at, at work as a high school um, in sort of natural environments. So starting with the thought that everything you do, from the time to the sound to the light to the floor to the seating, is, is affecting your students in some significant way or another. The higher the needs, the more different the student is from that mainstream norm, the more important this is. But in fact, this is something that crosses every socioeconomic group. Because like I said, kids at the privileged schools didn't know how to ask their own question. They need to learn choice in the same way the kids at the poor school need to learn how to. Um, because to me, we succeed in education Gender success in education this way. How many choices will our students have when they're 30? The more choices they will have about their lives, their career, where they live, what to do with themselves, when they're 30, the more successful we are. Everything else really doesn't matter, because we don't know. We don't know what they'll need in terms of skills. Uh, we sure don't need know what they'll need in terms of you know, technical skills, because we, we don't, we have no idea what devices will exist. I love when people say the iPad will be the future. The iPad exists already, it's five years old. It surely won't be the future. <laughs> it's clearly the past. We can move beyond it, <laughs> but you know, I'm not complaining about it, but I'm just saying it's not the future. You know, it was the future when it was first shown in the movie 2001, which was made in 1968. That's the first movie where you see the iPad. <laughs> um, so my challenge to you as you're thinking about all this is what can you do tomorrow? What one thing can you go in and do tomorrow that starts to change your classroom? This is what I always ask people to do. There are a few of us in the world who can change everything and put up with that chaos. Whether I'm one or not, I'm not entirely sure. I can sometimes get thrown by my own decisions, but that, that's okay. The guy, Michael, whose class you saw doing the, the Ruth Goldberg thing is one who can change everything, then it's, you know, that's fine. But what most of us need to change more slowly, and the first thing is learning to jump off the cliff. What do I give up? The first thing I suggest to people is, don't be afraid of your students. I just did this trip, I saw 15 schools in Ireland of all sort of ages uh, doing this tour with them. And one of the things we, I was with a couple of people, and one of the things we noticed is, in not one school did we ever see a rule posted on a wall. Not once. It's really interesting. The 
schools weren't chaos, <laughs> despite this amazing lack of <laughs> do this, do that posted. There were no no signs. There were no behave properly signs. There were no etiquette signs. They just didn't have that. Um, their assumption was that their kids would behave somewhat appropriately for the space they were in. They also had no age divisions. You know, it was just kids were together and they were shocked at the idea that anyone would try to teach all of one age group. Because the base, as one of the teachers said, I don't understand if all eight-year-olds here is eight or eight-year-olds talking, how will they ever grow? Um, we also saw zero age-appropriate context. They don't have, that is, there are no, there are kids' books, of course, but there's no kid curriculum. They speak, you know, in adult words, <laughs> adult things to older kids. And I thought, well, you know, that's really interesting. Because Irish kids at age 12 have double the vocabulary of American really kind of a significant difference. But I saw them reading The Ulster Cycle, which is effectively like Beowulf, to four-year-olds. So, you know, they're just tolerating. This is the other level of choice. Third grade class, day after Thanksgiving. It's a very standard assignment. You've got to write three sentences about what you did at Thanksgiving, and you've got to draw a picture of one. Look at all the different ways these kids choose to do this. We don't have one-to-one. -one. We don't have all the same one-to-one, -one, certainly. Not every kid picks the computer. Some kids working together. Most are working separately. Uh, this kid is dictating and then copying down what Dragon writes down on his thing for him. <laughs> uh, that's what he wants to do. Um, Here's Mr. Old School, with his big dictionary. And his <laughs> it's all okay. It's all a tech choice. Um, and kids, you know, will, will do what they have to do. Now, you know, that's the beginning of the third month of school. It takes a while to get kids comfortable with making all those choices. <coughs> that's a fully inclusive classroom not <laughs> chosen because they're the gifted kids or anything like that. Um, and they're fully capable of doing that kind of work. I took this picture when I was in Cove in Ireland, right across the street from the White Star Line office. This is one of those great spots. Um, but so this is a pub. And look at all the choices you have of seating, right? Do we have the same choices in all our classrooms? How do people want to sit? What makes them comfortable? What are they going to do? If you need this range of comfort to drink, you sure need it. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a multi-age thing. And with parents involved in, in Curlis in Ireland and County Tipperary, kids sort of gathered together, running back and forth, talking to each other, um, using the age range to um, support what they're doing. I was like this. This is a monument in New York, and it contains things like a 17th century house in it and a field and all sorts of stuff. But there's also no problem with wheelchairs getting through it. You can read all you want. These are all words in here. But you don't have to read anything to get through the experience. It's a level of teaching which lets everyone access it on their terms. There are some problems sometimes with trying to run everything online, and we're seeing some of that today. I think this is an interesting thing because I've done a lot with the voc rehab agencies. They're constantly having trouble with, like Walmart especially in America, because cashiers have to stand up all day. A lot of our people can't do that. 
There was one time when my wife and I were in Ireland and she said, how come none of their cashiers stand up? <laughs> we're like, they don't do that thing. <laughs> they all sit down. So it changes the job <laughs> in a real interesting way. Um, and lets a lot more people access that job. This is, you know, like someone's working at Mozilla. This is their main workroom. Again, there are no offices. <coughs> if they need privacy, there are little rooms they can go into and, you know, where they can be on the phone that are sort of sound controlled. But otherwise, people take their laptops and go wherever they want to go. Um, I always say that when we give devices to students, the first thing we have to do is let students learn to individualize them and use them as they need them to. Um, I have so this is something I worked on that we worked on in Michigan. So this is a four gigabyte flash drive. You plug it into any Windows computer, it turns it into a completely accessible computer for everybody. That will read to you, that will do everything <laughs> uh, you want to do, and you can carry it with you, personalize all the settings, control everything, and it's free. So it's um, <coughs> well, it's the cost of the drive. And then I sort of reach back, and I know we're sort of running out of time, and say that, and I, I this speech works better in, in, in Ireland than it does in the Midwest of the United States. But <laughs> before the Reformation <laughs> and Gutenberg, which happened at the same time, Information was given in the most media-rich, distracting, if you will, possible environment. The Catholic mass is filled with sight and sound and smell and movement. Um, you know, there are statues all over the place and the stained glass windows are doing something for you. And any way you want to learn, you learn. Of course, they didn't have books. And they still don't have books in the Catholic mass. Reading is a group thing, not an individual task very rich and designed for to reach everybody in some way or another. Our schools, because they developed in very Protestant, very Calvinist New England, <laughs> are designed like Calvinist churches. And I live in Western Michigan, so I'm at the center of Calvinism in the United States. They are, they are rectangular boxes with a person at the front. <laughs> um, Everything focused in one direction, everybody with a book in their hand, and everybody on the same page, which is an entirely different thing. So one of the things I talk about is the post-Gutenberg era that we're entering has a lot more to do with the pre-Gutenberg era than it does with the last 500 years, which may be looked at as a sort of aberration in human communication, where learning was linear and sort of all the same, and distributed in one specific way. And that's a hard thing for us to wrap around because we've lived in the last 500 years. <laughs> that's what's dominated our lives. But it's, so when we think about it, Heidegger, who is a philosopher we all hate to quote because he sort of was a Nazi, but he gets at that. He actually, in one of his great books, broke apart the Greek word technology what it really is, the art of manipulating the world. And that's what technology means. It is how we manipulate the world. So when you think of technology in your classroom, when you go back tomorrow, how do you help each student manipulate the world to their advantage? I always say, as a person who still struggles to read text, that I have all these different ways, depending on where I am, of hearing it, of converting it into speech. So I use a program called WIN, which is an expensive program, W-Y-N-N, that I really love and have used for a long time for big, complex reading. I use um, Firebox, which is a plug-in to Firefox for very quick stuff when I'm online. I use uh, what's called Vala Volca, a very easy, free text-to-speech word processor that I use a lot. Um, I have a Ford, so my car converts um, 
my Android phone text messages and emails into speech and says them to me, and if I dictate them back, it sends the message back. Yeah, I have all these tools at my disposal to manipulate the world so that it's okay for me. Um, I'm sort of a literature geek. I've read Ulysses six times now. Not many people can say that. <laughs> but I've never held a print version of it in my hand. I've listened to it on originally cassette. It was 68 cassettes. <laughs> More of this box. Uh, <laughs> I've listened to it on, on CD. I've, I've listened to it on you know, on YouTube where you can watch the whole thing and, and have people read it. I read it with digital readers so I could pick it apart and work with it myself. I've never held it on paper. So I have found all these ways to manipulate text to make it work for me. Because what's important about reading is not anything about reading. We unfortunately teach reading and writing as if they're skills that have some value on their own. They don't. <laughs> there is no value to writing with a pen or to even key things in. The value is you're expressing your story to the world. The value of reading is you're taking in stories or information in a way that you can work with them. Kids have to have access to the text and access to communication first before they have any reason to read or write. Despite my really miserable time at school, my mother was a third grade teacher, and she would always say, every kid Almost every kid arrived at her class at the beginning of third grade hating books and hating reading. Because, of course, we had taught reading as this skill, which has no purpose. The same way Conrad Wolfram talks about we teach math by teaching arithmetic, which has nothing to do with math, and which bores kids to death. <laughs> um, this is this one teacher who calls the ball wisher. So students say, I want to study this using books or using an iPod or using a computer <coughs> or using the library, getting them to make logical <coughs> technology, technology choices for themselves that push themselves into a way. And of course, you can't let kids learn to do this unless, unless you let them learn to make mistakes and have it go really badly sometimes to say, ew, that didn't work. No. <laughs> uh, let's try something else. Like so we talk about technology which liberates, technology which empowers kids to do things that they could not do before. I'm a huge fan of, of the whiteboard paint, idea paint, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we've smeared it on the walls of schools all over Virginia every good time. But this was a middle school English class I worked with. Just a little image there. I talked to these kids about that writing was expressing yourself, and that the first thing you have to do is express yourself. So three weeks later, I get to see this movie these three boys have made. Two are homeless. The third's father isn't allowed in the building because he's a violent sex offender. Um, so these are not your star sort of students going on. But they made this silent movie, vampire movie, that was so incredible, <laughs> so expressive, so effective. And suddenly, we had writers on our hands, <laughs> where before, you know, we didn't have anything. Talk about technology which comforts. How do you make kids safe and comfortable and OK so that they can focus on the task at hand? What does it do? And, and it's not all about chaos. I have a really good friend who's very Asperger's in his 40s who always says, Ira, the chaos school you like would have been better for me because the other kids would have been happier, but I still need a tunnel to get through it. <laughs> and it's a place to be safe within that. So it's not just, so this was in this little tiny school in Ireland. They just made these little reading books <laughs> where kids could go hide. And, um, find their places. This is a seventh grade English classroom. Doesn't have to look like all we really did was mostly throw stuff out and found this old couch um, that somebody else was throwing out. And technology which pushes kids. And that can be, it doesn't have to be anything in particular, but you want technology that shoves kids into the world. 
where they engage the world and learn how to function with stuff. Uh, and so whether that's writing on the floor or Skyping across the country, which we're doing here, um, doesn't really matter, but pushing kids out into the world. And heavily technology which equalizes. I dearly love this, this is Hugo Cabret, because it challenges our idea of what books do, even though it's print. <laughs> Half the story is, of course, told entirely in pictures, and pictures you have to interpret, which is a different skill than interpreting alphabetic text. With his second book, Wonderstruck, which I say my wife and I read together, she read the text part, I read <laughs> the picture part. <laughs> um, you know, you have two things where it's two different stories, and each is told in, in, in its own way. But it shows that there's lots of ways to communicate, and we and we mistake things when we put all our emphasis on, on a single technology solution. Um, and so, whether kids want to work alone very carefully or work in groups very wildly, you know, we need those spaces to allow kids to have. Because this tech which enables people is, is so critical. We have in our hands all these tools, whether they're our phones or anything else. And you know, if you do secondary school, your kids will have them in their pockets, which can enable a million things kids may not be able to do on their own. And we have to make that work. I read this real interesting quote on the plane coming over in a, a book about that I have on a Kindle app about the Titanic and, and it's about the, the other ships that night. And one of the things it said was that at the end, the US Senate inquiry, one of the things they said was that wireless telegraphy was too important a technology to be left to the whims of the captain, the whims and knowledge of the captains of ships. Every ship had to be using this 24-7, whether the captain thought it was a good idea or not. <laughs> really true. I mean, had all the ships in the area been using the radio that night, no one would have died on that boat. If you have, if your students have in their hands to their reading problems, their writing problems, their attention problems, whatever else, and your school or your classroom is deciding not to use it, that's kind of a criminal <laughs> act. To be it's sort of an educational malpractice. If we have the solutions in our hands, we need to, we need to make them available and use them in, in an aggress aggressive way as we can help solve the problems. So I love these kids sitting in the uh, club chairs there. But you know, it really doesn't matter if people are possible. And technology of which connects people, and this is sort of where I'm ending. The thing on the right is a sculpture a guy did a few years ago in London and Brooklyn, where he created a sort of Jules Verne recreated a Jules Verne kind of story from the 19th century of something called the telectroscope, where you could see underneath the Atlantic. But your classroom should have this all the time. It should be connecting places all the time, because you have the ability to do that very easily. And I talked about telectroscopes where you're connecting and fantastic windows where you're just watching. You know, whether you have the eagles from Iowa up on the screen, if you're not doing anything else, or if you're looking at NASA's pictures of Mars, or anything else, bring the world into your kids in, in an aggressive way as you possibly can. Um, and so, you know, what we're sort of talking about here is learning spaces that don't have boundaries, that break through what kids, um, what limits kids these days. And that don't have limits, that let kids go wherever they sort of need to go to get where they have to do it. That are human-centered, and last quick clip, 
But this is a classroom where, and I'll talk through this, some of you saw it over there. Um, this is a, a third grade classroom in Michigan, and, and the teacher said, could you come and look at my room? And what I do when I first see a room is I film kids' feet. <laughs> Kids, even by second grade, know to keep their upper body in a way that will keep them out of trouble with the teacher. But when you look at their feet, you start to see all sorts of stuff, a sense of whether they're panicked or bored to death or um, stuff. So we, we do this, and, and the kids go out to play, and I show him this, and I say, well, why don't you say, let the kids pick where they want to sit? Because right now, they look little board. It's a great teacher, but, you know, and in a one-to-one -one school with an iPad, and yet, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, there's not a lot of engagement going on here. So, we have to, I know, right? Well, believe me, I see this every day in every classroom, you know? So I say, let's loosen it up. Let's kid, let kid the kids pick where they want to go. And the kids slowly start to move um, and pick their own spots. This is an hour and a half later. <laughs> um, and by the next day, <coughs> he's sending me, we'll see this, pictures like this. <laughs> um, And by the time Christmas comes, he spends his Christmas break building these whiteboard tables for the kids to replace the furniture he's got. Now most of his classroom is these whiteboard tables he built and five gallon paint pails that the kids sit on. <laughs> carry around to sit on. Um, and he says, you know, the reading scores went up. <laughs> Um, nothing cost almost anything, um, and it's just 